So we start the conference with the first uh, plenary session. Our first speaker is Professor Doug Westertal of the University of Stockholm, where he is Professor of Logic and the Theoretical Philosophy. Doug Westertal doesn't really need uh, much of a presentation because he is uh, uh, very well known as a logician and um, also philosopher of language and philosopher of mathematics. Um, the title of his talk today is Logical Constants from Consequence Relations, Carnap's Question. Please. Thank you. Maria Carla, thank you for, to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So, um, I want to talk about logical constants. Uh, not everyone thinks this is a very exciting topic. Some people think it's almost impossible to say anything interesting about it. But actually, uh, tell me if I, Am, am, am I, can you hear me? Am I too close to the mic? It's okay? Okay. Um, logical constants is very much are very much tied to the notion of logical consequence, of course. And as soon as you specify a formal language in logic, you begin by listing the logical constants. And when you define logical consequence, consequence relation, there may be many such relations in one language, they're also they're defined in terms of such a specification. So it's a legitimate question, I think, to ask what makes a symbol logical, and maybe even why do the, our familiar logical symbols mean what they mean? So the, this talk is about uh, giving an answer to such question in a by exploring the relation between logical constants and logical consequence in a new way. I'm not the first to ask this question, of course. Uh, I think Bolzano was the first to realize that this is an important question. In his Wiss Wissenschaftslehre, which is all about logical consequence, he also touches upon uh, logical consequence, or analytic consequence, as he call it, calls it, but he says that there is a it's not easy to, uh, to establish the difference between logical and non-logical concepts in a way that is not open to criticism. Uh, 100 years later, Tarski, in his famous paper on logical consequence, had the same problem. Uh, I know no objective reasons which would allow one, allow one to draw a sharp, sharp dividing line between these two categories. Of course, uh, it has been, this question has been studied in modern times from various points of view. So there is a model theoretic approach in terms of invariance, uh, which actually originates with, with Tarski essentially, but later. Uh, but it's not clear that it really solves the problem. Uh, topic neutrality or, or invariance under isomorphism is a necessary some, uh, condition for logicality, but not sufficient. And it's not easy to, although it has been tried by many people, to specify stronger forms of invariance that would do a better job. Then there are proof theoretic approaches, completely different in, in terms of the format of rules for introducing and eliminating logical constants. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that. My, my only personal uh, comment is that it's, it's, in these approaches it's, it's not clear to me what the exact range of possible meanings are that these constants could have. Uh, and that's something I hope to make more precise. So um, the idea here is to uh, look even more seriously at the uh, connection between consequence and co logical constants. So, start by taking a consequence relation as given, and then see to what extent you can uh, 
extract the meanings of certain of the symbols in the language. Um, for example, take standard first order consequence, the laws of first order logic. To what extent do these determine the meanings of not and, and the universal quantifier? That's a rather precise and uh, interesting question. It's also intuitively reasonable because we have some rather strong intuitions about what follows from what. We don't have strong intuitions about what's, what's logical and what is not logical. So it's, it's reasonable to start from that end. Of course, it presupposes that you know what you're talking about when you say the meaning of the universal quantifier. That has to be made precise. And here I'm going to rely on model theoretic notions of meaning or interpretation. But it's, the approach is inferential in the sense that it starts from the behavior of a consequence relation. So you can go about this in different ways. Um, one is to look at it completely syntactically. So start with an interpreted language. Some sentences are true, others are false. Then single out any set X of uh, symbols. So this is a power set of the set of symbols. You can define a consequence relation a la Bolzano from that set of symbols written like this. So gamma is a set of sentences, implies x phi if and only if every replacement of symbols outside x preserves truth. So that's essentially how Bolzano uh, defined consequence. But you can also go in the, oops, in the other direction. So start from a consequence relation. Um, in the language. And then say that a symbol u is in this set is a constant. If there is some valid inference which gets destroyed, which becomes invalid if you replace u by some other symbol. So, uh, I should, I should have said at the beginning that this is joint work with Denis Bonnet in Paris. And in our first paper on this, we looked at precisely at this, these two, and we looked at the conditions under which these two operations are inverses to each other. And um, also when this Bolzano style consequence is equivalent to Tarski style's consequence where you don't replace but you in reinterpret. And perhaps not surprisingly in both cases, the ability to, be, to, be, to expand the language is crucial. But that's not what I'm going to talk, say anything more about today. Uh, today I will talk more about the semantic idea of extraction of meanings. Um, in principle, that should give more information uh, about the meaning, because in the syntactic approach, the meaning is just the just sort of taken for granted, but it, there's no explanation of what it is. But if you have a semantic approach, and especially if you think of the language as generated by some grammar uh, from at at atomic symbols to complex symbols, complex expressions, and then you require that the interpretation must be compositional, actually that's going to play a crucial role here. And then you have an interpretation assigns semantic values to the atomic symbols and extends its composition to all expressions. There's a standard interpretation, other interpretations, and then you can have ideas about how to extract uh, um, the meaning of certain symbols. So one obvious idea, the most obvious idea is this, that say that uh, you, whoops, U is a constant with respect to this consequence relation here. If all interpretations consistent with that consequence relation agree on the interpretation of U. So what does it mean to be consistent? It means just what to think it means. Uh, if, um, sorry, if gamma implies phi, 
and all the, formula, all the sentences in gamma are true, then the phi is true. So it's just truth, pres pr truth preservation. Uh, that's, one, that's one natural way of talking about extracting the meaning. Uh, there's also another way that you can describe as follows. Um, say you have a class of, of interpretation and say that the symbol u is free if, if you take any interpretation in the class and another interpretation which agrees with that one on all symbols except possibly on u, then u is free. So it, you can interpret all possible interpretations of u, so to speak, are in that class. And then uh, there are two ways to extract. The first one I already mentioned, mentioned I called it u, u here. So that's the set of symbols who for all the interpretation in the class, agree with the standard interpretation. Uh, agree on the standard, the standard, the inter set of all U such that all interpretations in the class agree on it with the standard interpretation. And the other one is just to say that it's not free in that sense. And actually these are both quite interesting. You can see that U OK is included in NF OK, not the other way around, and it turns out that it's the Second method that corresponds to the syntactic approach I, I mentioned before. But this is just, um, I'm not going to talk about this. There are things to say here, but I'm not going to talk about that either. I'll focus on the first uh, syntactic method. Uh, sorry, it's the first semantics method here. So, what's the general question? To what extent does a consequence relation in a language L just a syntactic relation between sets of sentences and sentences, fix the meaning of certain symbols. Should one perhaps re require that logical symbols are completely determined in this way? Well, Carnap thought so. And he wrote a book in 43, not very well known, but anyway, The Formalization of Logic, where he, um, the whole book is about stating and trying to resolve a worry that he had in this respect, namely that even for classical propositional logic, that consequence relation does not fix the meanings, which in this case is just the truth tables of the standard connectives. So here's the very simple argument. Evaluation is a bivalent assignment of truth and falsity to all formulas. Now consider the following evalu uh, evaluation, B star, it just says that phi is true if and only if it's a tautology. Well, that's consistent with propositional consequence because if the premises are tautologies, the conclusion is a tautology. But uh, it's not the standard one, right? Because V of P and V of not, V star of P, V star of not P are false, but V star of P or not P is true. So that's not the standard truth table for disjunction. You do get the standard table for conjunction, and that's an asymmetry between conjunction and disjunction that worried Karna. So I'm not going to say anything about how to try to resolve this. I want to say that as soon as you apply the perspective of formal semantics, namely of compositional meaning assignment, the problem disappears or is solved. Uh, now you require of valuations that they should extend valuation of propositional letters true, to true and false, they should extend compositionally to all formulas and that the valuation V star is not compositional and you can see that uh, if compositionality is required then actually um, classical consequence, in fact already intuitionistic consequence, uh, well okay never mind that. Um, determines the, 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 the truth tables, the standard truth tables. So let me see. I think I will, there's an example of this, I think I will skip that. Um, now this is just a very simple example, but the point in this talk is that you can ask the same questions for any logical language and any consequence relation. And sometimes you get interesting answers. So take first order logic. 
Well, some things must be in place for that question to make sense. You must have a general uh, uh, recursive syntax. That's completely standard. You must have a semantic framework where interpretations assign semantic values to the primitive expressions. This is completely standard too, but uh, remember we don't know yet which symbols are logical and which are not, so we have to interpret the connectives and the quantifiers as well, not just the so-called non-logical constants. We need a truth definition as usual. Uh, what are the semantic values of formulas? Well, they are sets of assignments in first order logic. You need a precise range of, of possible interpretations. And what is the precise range of interpretation for the universal quantifier? Well, we take this to be a just a generalized quantifier of type 1, which is on each domain, m, a set of subsets of m. And you need a standard interpretation. And what's the standard interpretation of, of this symbol? Well, it's this set of subsets, the uniset of the universe. So that's what you want to fix. Well, we already know that by the earlier result that the connectives have the standard meaning. So the only question is about the universal quantifier. And uh, in a paper uh, last year in Erkentnis, we uh, proved that if the interpretation over domain M is consistent with first order logic, well, if and only if, uh, the interpretation of the universal quantifier is a principal filter on the set of subsets of M. If you, in addition, require a topic neutrality or permutation invariance, then you get exactly the standard interpretation. So let me just remind you, uh, well, okay, so you also get the identity standard. Let me just remind you what a filter is. A filter is a set of subsets which is closed under intersection and supersets. And the principal filter is generated by a particular set, so it's a set of A, so it's a set of, of, uh, set, a set of supersets of A. So that's, we'll see what that means in, in just a minute. Let me just say what this proof hangs on. It actually hangs on this property of uh, uh, this logical truth in first order logic, that you can switch the order of the universal quantifiers. If you translate that to a semantic condition, let R be a binary relation, let R of A be the set of successors, R A be the set of successors to A, uh, and then the condition that, that that is valued translates to this thing holding. You don't have to uh, think too much about that. Let's call it commutativity. And the interesting part of the proof is to show that this actually implies principality of the filter. Uh, OK, so when you have a principal filter to interpret the universal quantifier, the truth definition, the truth condition looks like that. For all x phi is true in M or satisfied by F in M, if and only if for all uh, elements of A, which is the generator of the filter, phi f x of A holds. So this is not standard predicate logic. It's, it's the so-called outer domain semantics for free logic. You have a subset of real objects over which the quantifiers range, but then you have some other objects possibly in the universe. Uh, so consistency with first order logic does not fix the meaning of that but it constrains it in a rather interesting way. And if you combine it with isomorphism in that, permutation invariance, um, the meaning is fixed. So the conclusion is that given that logical constants should be topic neutral, the classical consequence relation of first order logic completely determines the standard meaning of the logical constants, which is a rather nice result. But as I said, you can ask this question um, about any logical language. So I'm going to spend the rest of this talk to doing that. First, you could look at other quantifiers, generalized quantifiers, which again, a, a quantifier is, a generalized quantifier is, is a 
function Q, which with any universe, any universe M associates a set of subsets of M. So here's a familiar one, LQ1, Kiesler's uncountably many quantifier. And it has a nice, it's obviously isomorphism invariant. It has a nice, simple, complete axiomatization. But in no way <laughs> does it determine the meaning of Q1. For example, the axioms that Kiesler had are satisfied not only by uncountably many, but also by infinitely many, for example. In fact, <coughs> they're satisfied, here's the result about that, they're, they're satisfied by all the uh, quantifiers of that form. So actually, this leads to a rather bold conjecture, which we don't know how to prove, but anyway, it's a conjecture, that it's only the first order definable quantifiers that can, whose meaning can be fixed in this way. If that's true, that would be a rather nice characterization of first order logic, but it's just a conjecture. Here's another logic, intuitionistic logic, intuitionistic propositional logic. Well, now, of course, you can't deal with truth values anymore. You have to have a semantic framework, and the question is, which one do you want? Here are a couple of uh, poss possibilities. Kripke semantic, Beth semantic, topological semantics of increasing generality up to algebraic semantics. So this is interesting because now there's a sort of richness of choice of semantic frameworks. Note that completeness has nothing to do with this question. All of these semantic, uh, uh, intuitionistic, intuitionistic propositional logic is complete with respect to all of these semantics but it may have a lot to do with Carnap's question. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, just say that this is actually some, a work in progress too. Uh, let me say a word, a word about intentional propositional logics in general. So possible word semantics, now the semantic values are no longer truth values, but they are sets of words, so you have some some universe of words and the semantic values are subsets of that domain. Uh, so what should the uh, connectives be interpreted as? Well, by compositionality, they should be functions from sets of words to sets of words. So the standard interpretation is of negation is complement and of disjunction is union, etc. But now there are lots of uncountably many possible interpretations, of course, if you have an infinite domain. And then you can have other operators like intentional operators of various kinds. So let's say that an intentional logic is a set of formulas containing all tautologies and closed under modus ponens in such a language. And then you can actually show that for any such intentional logic, the propositional connectives here have to have their standard interpretation. This is more surprising, I think, than the, the first result, but actually it's, it's true. Um, okay, I will skip that too. That's just another example of a logic for which you can ask Carnap's question, dependence logic, but I'm just, uh, le let me, yes, I think I, think I should skip that and go on to what I will spend the rest of this talk on, namely to try to ask, uh, to ask Carnap's question for uh, modal logic, and in particular, well, only for the interpretation of box. So I, I will talk uh, about this because it's things that I have been thinking about, we have been thinking about lately, and also because it raises some new conceptual issues that are, I think are interesting in themselves. Okay, the syntax is completely unproblematic. We just have propositional logic, propositional atoms, negation, conjunction, and uh, box. Other operators can be defined. But for the semantics, there is a, now you have to think a bit, what, what, what should the semantic framework be? Should we take Kripke semantics for granted? So should we take interpretations to have this form 
with a, a set of words, a binary relation and evaluation, where R is an accessibility relation and, and V here is evaluation. In that case, there is a clear standard interpretation, namely the usual truth clause for box. Box phi is true at, at W if and only if it's true at all successors. Uh, if and only if phi is true at all successors of W. Uh, or writing the semantic values directly. So um, psi double brackets M is the semantic value of psi in M. Then this is just this is just a reformulation of the standard truth clause. And then to ask Carnap's question, we would then consider other possible uh, truth clauses for box besides that one and see if there is something that forces us to use precisely that one. But it's not clear that this is the right approach. It's not clear that it's general enough. Uh, because Kripke semantics is already a substantial commitment. It's not just motivated by the syntax and by compositionality. If you just go by syntax and compositionality, then the interpretation of box is just a function from set of words, sets of words to sets of words, just like negation, for example. And you should sort of look at all such interpretation and see if the Kripken ones are sort of, in what sense they are special. Of course, you need to say something about what is special about modal logic. And I think if you look in textbooks in modal logic, you will get uh, the following two answers. First, it's what I call here truth relativity. Sentences are true at, at words or states or indices or points. I'm going to call them words. There's also truth locality, which says that only the words which are some, in some sense close to W matter for the truth of a formula at W. So if you go by A here, then you see you get immediately two possible word semantics. Semantics values are now sets of words. And I'll come back to B later, I hope. OK, so we start there. and. We only consider interpretations which are consistent with, with uh, which are consistent with intentional logics or consequence relations. So we already know that these two symbols have the standard interpretation. The only thing to interpret is box. But what is the standard interpretation? Now it seems that uh, there's not just one, but several. Uh, we should, maybe we should say that Kripke frames based on accessibility relations are the standard interpretations. But the point is we should not take that for granted. We should arrive at this when we ask Carnap's question by some co constraints on, uh, on the interpretations imposed by perhaps some modal logics. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, Right, that's what I just said. And maybe we won't be able to single out exactly the Kripken interpretations, but at least constrain the uh, range of interpretation in an interesting way. So this is different than the case of, of the universal quantifier, where we had one unique standard interpretation. OK, so let's be a bit more precise. A local interpretation is just a pair of um, W, a set of words, and a function from sets of words to sets of words. And you have, well, a global interpretation associates with each domain such a local interpretation. And then the truth definition looks like this. And not and and are standard. And the only interesting clause is um, this one, which says that box means whatever the function f says it means. Uh, this is local. Obviously, at some point, you would have to go to global interpretations, but I don't think I will have time to talk about that today. Okay. 
So, uh, now, a local interpretation, as I said, is a such a function. There is another way to look at it, namely, for each word, you can think of it as a family of subsets, namely this one, the family of subsets x, such that F w is in uh, f of x. So uh, that specifies for which uh, phi, the formula box phi, is true at w. And you can go back and forth between these two representations. And the second representation is actually familiar from the li literature. It's it, in the guise of neighborhood frames. That's what they're called. The clause for truth in neighborhood semantics is exactly the same as the one we had. So uh, the first characteristic of modal semantics, truth relativity, leads directly via compositionality to neighborhood semantics, which is interesting because that's a familiar thing. It was introduced in the 70s by, or 60s by Scott and Montague, and others have looked at it, and recently there's been a sort of surge of interest in neighborhood semantics, although no, not from this point of view, but from other points of view. It's the most general form of possible word semantics, and Kripke semantics is a special case. So what does that mean? Well, remember that the Kripke frame looks like that, and uh, let's call the neighborhood frame Kripke, and if there is an accessibility relation R, such that f of x is a set of w, such that these are the successors of w, according to R, is included in x. Actually, if there is such, it's, it's unique, and then you get the usual truth clause for, from Kripke semantics. Uh, if you, you can also go the other way around. If you start with the Kripke frame, then this thing defines a corresponding neighborhood frame. And now you, it's not very hard to show that uh, a frame is Kripkean if and only if each of these families of subsets is a principal filter and uh, also you, uh, it's F is multiplicative in this sense. That's also an equivalent condition. Okay, I'm going to assume that you know the names of some familiar modal logic, so I'll go back to, directly to Karna's question. And we're interested in how consequence relations or modal logics constrain the interpretation of box. There's no unique standard interpretation, but we think of the Kripken ones as standard. Uh, so the best possible result would be if we can actually, if the property of being Kripken was modally definable. But well, that turns out not to be the case, and to see why it's good to look at things a bit more abstractly. So start with a logic, uh, sorry, yes, a modal logic L, which is a set of formulas, and some class C of frames. Validity on a frame is defined as usual, and now given L, val L is a set of frames which validate each theorem of L, Log C is a set of formulas which are valid in each frame in C. And then there is a well-known connection between these two notions. Uh, here it is again up there. Just follows directly from the definitions. And now you say that L corresponds to the class C if C is equal to val L. And you say that L is complete with respect to C if L is equal to log C. Uh, and actually, what Car we can see that what Carnap was looking for in that book is really correspondence in addition to completeness. So here are some quotes. He says that PC propositional calculus does not completely fulfill its purpose, although it's complete. That's the second paragraph. But what else could we require? Uh, well, the conclusion, blah, blah, uh, is that we have of complete formal representation is wrong. This is shown by the possibility of non-normal interpretations. That, that's the one we have saw an example of earlier. So it's correspondence. And there are lots of results of this form in modal logic. For example, S5 corresponds to the class of equivalence relation. And S5 is also complete with respect to that class. 
S phi is also complete with respect to the class of universal uh, relations uh, or frames where the relation is universal and that shows easily that that class is not modally definable. If you now look at our case where we have the Kripkean interpretations and then there is a subclass which I'm calling partition interpretations where uh, the, the corresponding accessibility relation is in fact an equivalence relation then you can see that those correspond to S5 and that S5 is complete with respect to PI. Uh, now it's also well known that it's known that K is complete with respect to the class of Kripken interpretation as well as the class, more general class of, of uh, frames where the, the, the families of sets are supposed to be filters and that shows again that this what we wanted for is what we asked for is not possible the class of Kripken interpretations the class we're interested in is not modally definable uh, Here's another interesting class of interpretations. It goes back to the 40s. So you have a topology on a set, and uh, with, as usual, and you have an interior function. The interior of the set A is the largest open subset of A. And a neighborhood frame is a topological interpretation if F is the interior function for some topology. And then there are these uh, familiar results that S4 corresponds to the set of topological interpretation is also complete with respect to that uh, class and that's actually a result from McKinsey and Tarski in the 40s. Um, mm -hmm. So the class of topological interpretations is modally definable, the class of partition interpretations is modally definable, the class of Filter interpretation is also modally definable by S4, S5, and K respectively, but the class of Kripken interpretation is not. On the other hand, we do have a, a result, namely that only standard interpretations are consistent with S5, which is not at all true for S4, for example. So why does S5 has this property is a natural question and is it perhaps the smallest modal logic with that property. So it turns out that the axiom that matters in S5 is a so-called B axiom which looks like this or equivalently it is an equivalent formulation of the B axiom and when you formulate it like that and translate it to the corresponding property of a neighborhood frame it looks like this. So you have start with, uh, you start with um, Uh, this frame, WF, uh, G is the dual function corresponding to possibility and then that axiom uh, looks like that and if you're an algebraist this will look familiar to you because this says essentially that the algebra, the Boolean algebra with operators consisting of the the set of subsets of W, union, intersection, complement, 0, 1, and the function G here is uh, what uh, residuated. And it turns out that um, as soon as the neighborhood frame is consistent with KB, then it has to be Kripian. And it turns out this, we have this result for S5, and then Wesley Holiday told us that actually it holds for this weaker theory, uh, weaker logic, and it's actually a, a known result uh, about, it follows from a known fact about residuated Boolean algebras with operators. And there's also an answer to the other question uh, which was uh, f given to us by Tadeusz Litak. We asked the question and then he thought about it and answered it, um, namely that uh, if you take any normal extension of S4 which is consistent with only Kripken interpretation then it actually is an ex S5 is a sublogic of that. And he also has a conjecture that essentially this property of being residuated is necessary for that, for that to hold. 
So what we have so far is that in the case of first order logic, uh, a model in is consistent with that if and only if the interpretation of the quantifier is a principal filter. Uh, in modal logic, we don't get if and only if, but we get the one direction. If it's consistent with KB, then this is um, Kripken standard. So it is an answer for Carn to Carnap's question for box. And um, we also have some idea of the minimal modal logics that, that force this fact. Uh, so there are some similarities, but there are also differences between the universal quantifier and box. Um, another thing is that it's obvious that in the first order case you should look at this consequence relation, but in the modal case you, should, you, want, you would want to look at this rather than KB. Which, so uh, you would like, it would be nice to have some extra natural structural requirement that together with consistency with K singles out the standard interpretations. So one uh, suggestion would be permutation invariance, which works so well in the first order case. And to save time, let me uh, skip the uh, definitions and just look at that theorem. It says that the only non-trivial permutation invariant interpretation which is consistent with S5 is that one. And what, what is this? Well, this is actually, this function is the one that corresponds to the Carnap notion of necessary truth. Truth, necessary true is the same as true in all words. So, so that's a rather drastic uh, result that, that gives you just exactly one uh, uh, interpretation of box, namely truth in, uh, true in all words. Um, well, but is it reasonable to, to require permutation invariance? Well, in first order logic it is because it's, as I said, it's topic neutrality. It, the, you permute the individuals, the things you talk about. In modal logic, it's not so natural perhaps to permute the words. Well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're talking about necessity as logical truth, then the word you're in shouldn't matter. So there it makes sense, and that gives you precisely that uh, interpretation with S5. But um, you can see that as sort of one application of modal logic, but modern modal logic is much more than that, has many other applications to knowledge, belief, time, obligation, information update, program execution, etc. And if you want something which is common to all of those, uh, well, in those cases, it can be the case that it, it, it makes a difference which word you are standing at. So you cannot require uh, permutation invariance in general. So I'll just end with uh, um, mentioning one other possible structural constraint that you might think of, and that's the second, I said earlier that this is the second characteristic of modal logic. Namely, the first one was truth relativity, the second one was mo truth locality. What that means is completely clear in the Kripkean case, because if you take a Kripke model and any word, then there is a unique smallest generated submodel and it has the property that uh, the formula is true at W in the, the big model is exactly the same, those that are true in the smaller model. So truth is local, the part outside that uh, doesn't matter, which is very typical of modal logic and of course doesn't hold at all in, in predicate logic. So to generalize this, you need a notion of generated subframe for uh, arbitrary neighborhood frames, and we didn't find one in the literature, but uh, here's one suggestion. I guess I won't spend too much time on that, but so suppose you have a neighborhood frame here. You have a subset A. You can restrict the function to, to subsets of A by defining F A of X is F of X uh, intersected with A, and then you say that 
AG is a generated subframe of WF if uh, you also have this condition holding this condition holding and uh, why is that reasonable well first of all if it holds then G has to be that restriction that I mentioned second if you look at just Kripkean frames you get the exactly the usual notion of generated subframe third if you look at topological frames, then A uh, uh, and the restriction of the topology to A is a generative subframe of W int and that uh, interior function, if and only if A is an open set. And fourth, uh, you have this, what you, you have what you want for generated subframes, namely that uh, the, the truth value of a formula in a word in the generated subframe is the same in the generated submodel as it is in the big model. But uh, what's special about Kripke frames is that there is a smallest generated subframe and that's not at all true in the topological case. So let's say that a, a frame is strongly local if for every word there is a unique smallest generated subframe containing that word. Uh, that holds in all Kripkean frames and then you have the following result that if you look at frames consistent with S4 which is the same as looking at topological frames then the strongly local one are exactly the Kripkean one. So it's a kind of partial result. Uh, among the topological frames strong locality singles out the standard ones. But unfortunately if you go outside the topological frames, there are strongly local interpretations which are even consistent with K but not Kripkean. So there is a problem here and we would like to find a better notion of strong locality so that it together with consistency with K forces interpretations of Kripkean. Well, now I've given you uh, various uh, pieces of information about what happens when you ask Carnap's question for modal logic. So let me just summarize what I've been saying. I think questions in logic are worth asking if they have interesting answers. And my ambition in this talk has been to show that Carnap's question is such a question that does have interesting ar uh, answers. And uh, you can ask it for, in principle, any logical language and any consequence relation, and there are some results, but surely there is much more to be found here if one looks. Uh, it was easy to see that the usual connectives are completely determined, the meanings of them are completely determined by the classical logical laws of propositional logic once you assume uh, compositionality. It's more surprising, I think, that the same holds impossible word semantics. Uh, and for first order logic, there was also a satisfactory answer. Uh, the classical law force that symbol to be interpreted as a principal filter, which is, it means for all x in A for some subset of the domain. And if you add topic neutrality, you get a complete characterization of the standard interpretation. Nothing similar holds for other, for various generalized quantifiers. So now if you ask it for modal logic, no is, new issues arise. There is a conceptual issue, issue that I mentioned. Do you want to start with Kripke semantics or do you want to start more generally with uh, just arbitrary semantics, which in, in that that's, that's the way we explored here, which led us directly to neighborhood semantics. But you can also explore the first uh, option, and there are some results here that, there that I didn't have time to mention today. So neighborhood semantics is a familiar territory, but I think the questions we ask are slightly new, and, and the, there are also these new results that are maybe some interesting in themselves. So that's just to show that this asking Carnap's question actually leads to interesting results. Uh, but there is more to do in, in, in the realm of modal logic. 
Uh, it's also interesting to compare Carnap's question for the universal quantifier and the box. So they're interestingly similar because they, the answers involve principal filters in both cases. So you, you might think that they're exactly similar, but in fact, they don't seem to be. The proof of that fact involved in the first, in the first order case, this logical truth. In the second case, the B axiom. And it's hard to see that they have much to do with each other. The number of standard interpretation, that is, there's just one in the first order case. There are lots in the modal case. The role of permutation invariance differs. But, okay. Um, this is a final slide. Zero. Great. So, um, <clears throat> once you think of this idea, I think it's extremely natural to, uh, to suppose that relations of logical consequence, at least to some extent, fix the meaning of the logical symbols. And it's natural to explore that question. It agrees with the intuition that consequence is conceptually prior to logicality, uh, but it's also an, an idea that can be formulated precisely and explored mathematically. Uh, should one actually require, as Carnap seems to have done, in that book, that there is a complete meaning determination of the logical symbols by the logical laws. It seems that that would leave essentially only and and not and so on as logical constants. So our uh, attitude here is more pragmatic. We want to see how far this idea takes us and then uh, if interesting things happen, if you add invariance or other independently motivated constraints uh, if required. And that's it. Thank you. We have a few minutes for discussion. Questions, please. Uh, the, okay, the question was, what about second-order logic? Is it hopeless to ask Carnap's question for that? I, ha I admit I haven't really thought about second-order logic. I do think it's not hopeless, but I mean, you will need, you will need also additional constraints. Um, it's not hopeless because, I mean, for example, the fact that second-order logic is incomplete has nothing to do with this question because uh, that's a sort of orthogonal to the question. So, no, I think it's actually worthwhile doing it in that case too. But I, it's not something I have, have done. More questions? Here. Oh, thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, I have a question about modal logic because if if I if I got you correctly, you said that basically you you need the B axiom to get the principal filter. Yeah. And I mean, uh, quite often, uh, have you tried to add a backward-looking modality like in temporal logic? Because I mean, quite often you get the same effect of a B modality by having both a, a backward-looking modality and. A, Yes. onward looking modality, for example, for residuation matter. Mm. So it might be that if you have also that operator, you, you can mm. have a principal filter with K, and then you simply forget about the backward looking modality, and as a fragment, you get the logic K. I don't know if... Yes, no, that's a good point. And actually, um, as you said, this shows that... that uh, doing neighborhood semantics for temporal logic is, isn't really, it doesn't add anything because you're basically only in Kripke, among Kripkean interpretations anyway. So yes, that's right. It's a, there's, a, there's, a good, there's a strong connection to temporal logic there. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I didn't answer for temporal logic because it 
is a filter, but uh, this filter is on the time uh, frame, on the time scale. Yes? Yes. There are questions there, I think. Thank you. I just was wondering whether you have tried to mix up a model and first order logic to see what happens in that field. You mean model first order logic? Yeah, first order model logic. That's yet another project. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't looked at it. In that case, I'll have a small question. So this is all very nice, obviously. Uh, you haven't defined the logical consequence relation, though I take it you take it to be, you know, reflexive, transitive, and monotonic, <coughs> uh, right? Uh, well, for some of the facts, you need to assume that for the others, not. You don't need them. So uh, have you tried to look at this, you know, in the case of substructural consequence relations? I don't know what. What happens there? So, for instance, how do you track the, 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 the split between additive and multiplicative uh, connectives in uh, linear logic, say, or, you know, relevant logic or whatever? So, uh, if you can. That's say. obviously something you could do. I have not. So, in here, I had a semantic approach. So, a consequence relation is just a relation between sets of sentences and sentences. So the substructural uh, properties don't don't show up, uh, but again, that's something you could do, but which we have not done. <laughs> so I'm I'm grateful for all these suggestions of further applications of this uh, approach which was sort of the point of this talk. It seems that now they set you an agenda for the future. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your talk. Our second session, um, we have... Uh